Well, good morning. It's my pleasure and privilege to uh, welcome you to this broadcast from Money Hall Church in South Birmingham. My name is Phil Sweeting and I'm one of the ministers or pastors of the church here. It's great to welcome you whether you're watching live on Sunday morning or catching up at some later date. We're going to start by encouraging one another by reminding ourselves of some of the great central truths of our faith as we sing the great modern hymn, In Christ Alone, My Hope is Found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Let's sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength. It's great to sing of the security we have in Christ. Of course, one of the other privileges of being in Christ is to be adopted uh, into the family of God, to have access to God the Father, to be able to call him Daddy and speak to him in prayer. And that's what we're going to do shortly. One of the things that helps me in my own prayer life is a little app called Prayer Mate. Uh, it's a brilliant uh, tool um, because it, it, it enables you to put in various lists and things and it rotates through them so you, you don't have to remember it, which helps me. Uh, but you can also uh, set up various feeds from different uh, missionaries and mission organisations and other things, that whatever you want really, um, which help to uh, just to keep your uh, sort of food for prayer as it were. 
And one of the feeds that I subscribe to is by an American pastor called Scotty Smith. I love his prayers, which are always so um, very gospel centred. And one that I was using devotionally this week just seemed particularly connected to the themes of our passage this morning that we'll be looking at a bit later on in Psalm 121. So we're going to be praying uh, a modified version of that now. I'd also love us to pray this morning for the family of Edward Nelson, who was a pastor in Paris in France, the Evangelical Church in Turns, and he died this week um, through a, a head injury that he sustained in a climbing accident. He was uh, a godly pastor, heavily involved in church planting in that country, which is so um, needy in terms of gospel churches. And he leaves behind his wife, Laura, and four young children. Um, I didn't know him myself, but a, a good number of my friends knew him quite well. Uh, so I'd love to pray for that family this morning. And we'll also pray for our own church family in these strange times. So please join me to pray. First, a prayer from Scotty Smith. Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Heavenly Father, the battle for our heart's trust is unrelenting, especially during seasons of stress and fear. On this August Sunday, we affirm that you alone are worthy of our worship, love and trust. We also want to name your competition. In David's day, it was chariots and horses. In our day, it looks more like this. Some trust in a spouse's affection, a lover's interest or their children's attachment. But we trust in the steadfast love and great delight you have for us in Jesus. Some trust in political parties, seating their candidate and conspiracy theories. But we trust in Jesus, the ruler of the kings of the earth and his everlasting kingdom. Some trust in stock portfolios, cash flow and earthly treasures. But we trust in the immeasurable riches of Christ and the inviolate treasure kept for us in heaven. Some trust in being good, right and disciplined. But we trust in Jesus, who is our wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Some trust in a soon delivery of a Covid vaccine, being in control again and regaining the old normal. But we trust in the certain return of Jesus, the one who is making all things new and who calls us to a life of servant love. So we pray. In Jesus' beautiful and bountiful name. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, as Lord of all, we cry out to you for the family of Pastor Edward Nelson. We give you thanks for Edward's life and example in the faith, for his committed and joyful service of you, and for the vital work he was involved in planting churches in France. We pray for his family as they come to terms with their loss. We thank you for the confidence they can have that Edward is now with you. But we recognise that though this provides hope, it does not take away their pain or sense of loss. May they know your comfort at this challenging time. May you be their faithful provider in their uncertainty. May their church family in Paris bless them and encourage them in every way, even as they themselves are mourning the loss of their pastor. We pray that you would raise up others to serve the cause of the gospel there in France. We pray that others would be able to take up the work that Edward was involved in and that we might see many coming to put their trust in you in that land. Father, it's such a needy nation in gospel terms, so we pray you would do a great work there. We pray that the example of Edward would spur many others on to gospel service and sacrifice. For we ask in Jesus' name and for your glory. We pray too for our own church family. We pray for those who have received exam results or will do so in the coming weeks. We pray for a faith-filled perspective on results, whether they are better or worse than expected. Thank you that our identity in you is of greater significance and value than our certificates. But we pray for our young people that you might guide them on their next steps. Whether they head to further education or to employment, we pray that they would continue to put their trust in you and would grow in their faith in these uncertain times. We pray too for those who have been able to get away on holiday. 
May these breaks be times of refreshing for all concerned. May they find time to draw closer to you, as well as to draw closer to family and friends. We pray especially for Andy and the Cole family as they head off later today. Please refresh them and encourage them as they take time out from busy life and ministry. May they know you're strengthening and refreshing while they are away. Whether we're away at or at home, we pray that our time in your word this morning would do us good and encourage us in our walk with you. By your spirit, please be at work through the reading and preaching of your word. For we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to be continuing our series this morning in the Psalms or Songs of Ascent. And uh, Joe Naylor, one of our church members, is going to read to us now from Psalm 121. You can follow on screen or in your Bibles at home. And then uh, we'll hear a sermon on Psalm 121. Psalm 121, a song of ascents. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Where does my help come from? It's a really good question to ask. It's a question we all need to ask, if we're honest, though many of us are not very good at asking for help. Have you ever seen a small child trying to reach something that's too high? Uh, Or or trying to open something that's too tight for them? And just giving up in frustration rather than asking for help? Have you ever ended up taking a much longer journey than you needed to just because you didn't want to ask anyone for directions? I'll hold my hand up to that one. Or perhaps more seriously, uh, you've had a medical condition that got worse than it needed to just because you were reluctant to, to check it out at the doctors to ask for help. I, I know so many people who are brilliant at offering help, but are reluctant to ask. They'll offer help to anyone and everyone, but they'll never ask. Perhaps they don't want to appear weak. Uh, Perhaps it's a pride thing in that sense. Or perhaps it's a better motive. Perhaps they, they just don't want to be a burden to someone else. But I think more often than not, it's just born out of our fiercely individualistic culture which says, I can look after myself, I don't need anyone else. seems to me it's the complete opposite of the New Testament picture of the church, which is a body where every part is dependent on every other part. And in truth, asking for help and offering help is is a wonderful way of, of deepening relationships. Just this week, as some of you know, our fridge freezer packed up, And so we we asked on our neighbour's WhatsApp group if anyone had a spare fridge or a spare freezer we could borrow until we had time to replace ours. What a blessing when people I'd certainly never even spoken to before offered to help. And what an opportunity uh, now to bless them in return and to get to know them as a relationship that's formed uh, because we were willing to ask for help. Well... Where does my help come from is the question the psalmist asks in our very first verse. And the wonderful answer to that question is really the burden of the whole psalm. And I wonder if you spotted the sort of repeated theme here as Joe read it for us earlier. Our English translations slightly hide what's even clearer in the original. So verse 3 talks about he who watches over you. So does verse 4 and verse 5. He who watches over you, the Lord watches over you. Then verse 7 talks about the one who will keep you. And uh, verse 7 again, watch over you. And verse 8, he'll watch over you. 
over your coming and going. All those words are actually the same root in the original. So you get six times in just these eight verses this word which means to watch over or to guard, to be careful about, to protect, to keep. So this psalm is a great declaration of God's comprehensive watchful care and protection for pilgrims on their journey. If you were watching last week or have had a chance to catch up with Colin's sermon, he had five points. So to make up for that this week, I've only really got one, which is also my title. A comprehensive protection policy for pilgrims. A comprehensive protection policy for pilgrims. That's what God's offering. Uh, that's what's described in this psalm. And to help us try to grasp how wonderful this truth is, I want us to feel our way through it first in the sort of the position of an ancient Israelite pilgrim before we apply it to ourselves. We saw last week that the Psalms of Ascent are pilgrim songs, pilgrimage songs, associated with the various annual visits to Jerusalem that all faithful Israelites were called to make. And with that in mind, uh, we start immediately in verse 1 with a bit of a puzzle. Verse 1 says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? And the puzzle is this. Are these mountains that the pilgrim is looking at a concern or a comfort? Many different ideas have been suggested on both sides. So in those days, of course, the physical journey to Jerusalem would have been potentially full of peril whether from wild animals on the journey or robbers and bandits that would hide, um, particularly in the hills, on the way. So, so it might be he looks to the hills and he's worried about what he might find there. But equally possible is the idea that the hills in view here are the hills, uh, that well, the, the hill that Jerusalem, Jerusalem is on, Mount Zion. That, that, that this is really a sort of a expression of longing for home uh, and the sort of the security and hope that Jerusalem represents. You certainly use the same, see the same phrase used in that sort of way a couple of verse, uh, psalms later in Psalm 123. But then again, uh, the hills or the mountains, uh, the, the high places in ancient Near East culture, they were the places of worship for, for a whole range of so-called gods. A pilgrim uh, could be wondering if any of those deities might be a help to him or a threat to him on his journey. He, he might be wobbling as he feels the allure of these false gods. Or he might be intimidated and worried about their apparent presence. We, we don't know. Uh, exactly what's in his mind when he says that and I hope we'll see later that's actually a blessing as we apply it but the confident answer the declaration of verse 2 applies in all those different situations my help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth the God who made everything is able to watch over everything and to care for his people the hills might look big and scary, but God is even bigger. Remembering that, that God is the one who made heaven and earth is such a perspective restorer. This is not some tin pot local deity. This is the Lord of all. Notice too that this is about help on the journey. It is not a removal from the dangers and the situation. This isn't a promise of a trouble-free or a pressure-free life. But this is the assurance that there is one who is there alongside as helper. As David Attenborough might put it, if he understood the psalm, the pilgrim is a protected species. Listen to how verses 3 and 4 elaborate that confident declaration of verse 2. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. 
in some of the pagan nations around Israel at the time, that the idea of, of deities, gods, resting and sleeping was very common. You may remember Elijah on Mount Carmel in that great standoff with the priests of Baal, mocking Baal on that score as, as, as the prophets of Baal were waiting for him to answer. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's gone away. So, so this is another thing which makes Yahweh, the, the, the Lord God of Israel, distinctive and superior to any of those so-called gods. He never drops off. He never gets tired. I often wonder the difference between uh, slumbering and sleep. I know if you have uh, in this verse. It's, it's, a, it's a curious phrase, isn't it, in the English? Well, apparently one of the verbs here describes actual sleep, being asleep. The other describes that sort of head nodding stage, you know, where, where you're just about to drop off as opposed to sort of full on sleep. If you've ever been in a lecture or a meeting straight after lunch, or dare I say it, in an evening service after a long day, you can probably imagine what that's referring to. But our God is always fully alert. He won't let your foot slip on the path. His eye is never off the ball. This is in some ways particularly reassuring because we've been reminded that he's the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, and he's made it, but, but he's not abandoned it. He, he, he's not done the creation and then kind of gone off to do something else. He's not so powerful and high and lofty to be uninterested in what's going on here. He's a creator who's actively engaged with his creation, sustaining it and, and intervening in it. He, he's a, a creator who's watching over his chosen nation, Israel, to make sure, as, as one person put it, that their dangerous and imperiled path through history does not come to catastrophe. But the promise uh, is not just for the nation of Israel, is it? Verse 5 and 6 extended to the individual. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. I guess the need for shade for any journey in Israel should be obvious. In, in the summer months, uh, the temperature would probably have been in the 30s during the day, possibly in the 40s uh, in the drier southern regions. That's, by the way, that's about 110 Fahrenheit if you're in old money. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were down on the beach at Eastbourne in one of those really hot days that we've been enjoying and been blessed with recently. And the day before, I'd burnt um, my arms somewhat as I'd been sitting out in the sun without care. So, so on that day on the beach, I sat myself right up close next to the cliff face to try and find some shelter from the sun, which was so high. You've got to be really close uh, to get the shade. And in the same way, this is a beautiful picture of the Lord being your shade, the Lord being at your right hand, which implies a sort of a closeness, which is really touching. There may even have been a deeper significance uh, for that ancient pilgrim, because if you if you look at artwork of the time, you, you see it, it, it often uh, depicts these sort of um, Near Eastern kings with, with a shade bearer, with a huge sort of umbrella close at hand. And, and if you, as a sort of a subject of the king, were to enter the shade, well, that was a sign of great honour. That was a sign that you were under his protection you're in his inner circle so there may be a hint here that of course to have the lord as your shade is a high privilege i suppose we may feel that the the risk from the moon is rather less uh, fearful but but again for, for the the ancient pilgrim there may have been associations with with other gods or, or, or it might just be the idea that at night time, travelling at night or night times on journeys were dangerous. Wild animals might have been about. You might have been attacked whilst you were sleeping. But, but I think the idea of, of him protecting you from the sun and from the moon, it means, it means there's, there's no time at all when the Lord is not present. There's no time when his protection can fail. He, he's always there. He never sleeps. 
And as if to confirm that, then the final couple of verses broaden this theme out even more. We move from the sort of the immediate circumstances of the pilgrimage to the whole of life. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Derek Kidner, the great Old Testament scholar, captures this brilliantly. He says, it would be hard to decide which half of it, which half of the verse is more encouraging. The fact that it starts from now. Or that it runs on not to the end of time, but but without end. Like like God himself, who is my portion forever and ever. It's a lovely way of putting it. it. It really is a comprehensive protection policy for pilgrims. That phrase, uh, watching over your coming and going, your, your, your goings out and your comings in, it's meant to encompass um, everything in between as well. So as one uh, modern translation captures it, the Lord will protect you in all you do, now and forevermore. This must have been such an encouraging psalm to, to sing or, or declare before a long journey. In fact, I'm told that that, uh, that final verse of, of blessing is still spoken in Jewish tradition uh, when you touch the, the mezuzah, uh, which is a little scroll that, uh, that Jews would attach to their sort of doorposts and, and entrances. As you, so as you go into the house, you sort of pronounce the blessing as you touch that scroll. It's a wonderful promise, or a wonderful set of promises, but what does it mean for us? Does that comprehensive protection policy have any small print we need to be aware of? Well, as I've been preparing this, um, I've just heard about a friend of a friend who who was a pastor of a church in Paris, whose feet literally slipped in a mountaineering accident. And he died tragically, leaving behind his wife and four fairly young children. We prayed for them earlier on in the service. How does this psalm apply to him? He will not let your foot slip. He'll keep you from all harm. The first thing to remember when we're looking at um, psalms is that the promises that were physical in the Old Testament so often transfer their meaning to a more sort of spiritual sense in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, uh, the people of God, the Israelites, were on a journey to the land that God had promised them. They they were called regularly to make pilgrimage to the temple at Jerusalem. But for for Christians, Jesus has become our, our true temple. And our pilgrimage is not to a physical place on this earth. It's towards the new heavens and the new earth, being with him forever. So how are we to understand then this Uh, protection policies promise to keep you from all harm to watch over your life i think the words of jesus can help us here in a memorable passage where jesus is speaking about the trials of these final days uh, the days after his return to be with his father and the challenges for believers in this time he says this in luke 21 verses 16 to 19 he says You will be betrayed by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they'll put some of you to death. That sounds pretty final, doesn't it? But he continues, everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. How can someone be put to death and yet Jesus say not a hair of their head will be perish? Well, again, I think Jesus' words in Matthew 10, 28, um, just clarify this a bit, where he says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. The security in view in this psalm is much deeper and longer than the security of life in this world. One writer puts it, Evil can and will harm us in this life, but it can only do so much harm. Satan can make months or years or even decades miserable for us, but his leash is short and eternity long. Our flesh, our relationships, our feelings are painfully vulnerable for now, 
but our souls are perfectly and perpetually safe. He will keep your life, the psalm says, the life that matters most, the most satisfying and meaningful life, the one that lasts forever. That word translated life, he will watch over your life, is often translated soul. It's talking about who you really are, the bit that will last forever. And so I hope you can now see that we all need help. Because there's only one person who can offer us that kind of safety forever. There's nothing in this world that can offer us the kind of security that Jesus offers us. Whether those hills uh, we look to are, are things on the horizon that are making us anxious or concerned, the threat of coronavirus or, or of redundancy or of a relationship breakdown, the, the, the stock market crash that wipes out your savings, the exam results which weren't what you hoped for whether we're anxious about some of those things or or whether we're looking to some of those things actually for security sort of the flip side of some of those things if we have got good relationships or good savings or a good job or good results or whatever or, or, or whether we're um, looking to some less tangible things uh, like our looks or our social media likes or the approval of others whatever it is whether we're looking to these things fearfully or for security whenever we're tempted to, to, to dally with these things and to put on them more weight than they can bear. The psalm reminds us that we can lift our eyes up above all of these things to the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He never slumbers or sleeps, so we can. We don't need to lie awake anxious. We can, we can trust that he's still at work whilst we sleep. He is our shelter and our shade. It's not a promise that we can do without sun cream like I did the other day. But it's a much deeper and a more embracing promise that, that he's working all things for our good to keep us until we're with him in the new creation. The strong message of this comprehensive protection policy for pilgrims is that God is at work. Did you notice that as we went through? He's the active agent. Uh, he helps. He watches. He, he never sleeps. He, he shades. He keeps. He's at work throughout this psalm. There's, there's only one thing the psalmist does in the whole psalm. He asks for help. That's all we need to do. Maybe you're watching this and you're not feeling the need for help. Maybe you feel everything's going just fine, thank you very much, and, and you can get by very well on your own. And if that's you, I want to, su to suggest lovingly that you've lost your grip on reality. The events of recent months have surely shown us how much of our apparent security is actually an illusion. How vulnerable we are to the workings of a tiny little virus. But that this psalm speaks of the maker of heaven and earth, the one who created the very molecules that that virus is made from. His purposes can't be derailed. But perhaps, on the other hand, you're feeling a little anxious and worried at the moment. You're fearful for the future. Well, the good news of this psalm is whoever you are, whichever position you're in, you can call out for help from the Lord. He can and will keep you, however hard the journey feels at the moment. He's close enough to you to be your shelter and shade. He's watching over every step that you take. And he promises to bring you safely home to be with him in the new heavens and the new earth. I love the way Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1. He says we have an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. If that's not a comprehensive protection policy, I don't know what is. Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful assurance of this psalm. We thank you for the reminder of who you are, the maker of heaven and earth, of what you're like, active, watching, caring, keeping. We thank you that if we're trusting Jesus, then our lives are secure. Not that we'll never face troubles or hardships or even death in this life, but that you can keep us secure for all eternity if we're trusting in Jesus. How good these promises in your word are. Write them on our hearts. Help them still our fears when we're anxious. Help them uh, unsettle our complacency when we're self-confident. Help us to cry out to you. Our help, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to finish our time of worship this morning by singing one of my all-time favourite hymns, uh, which wonderfully captures the heart of this psalm. He will hold me fast. <laughs> 